Welcome everyone to uh, the next. Okay, one moment. I need to mute myself so that I don't uh, at least hear myself. But hopefully uh, you hear me. So yeah, uh, welcome to Iron Eagle, uh, the show where we uh, look inside Tag Eagle, understand uh, what it is, and more crucially, why it works that way. And uh, let's dive straight in. So. Uh, as a reminder, uh, what we've been doing uh, these uh, last past few episodes was uh, discussing consensus, how to implement uh, replicated uh, state machines. And uh, what we arrived at is that uh, we organize work in a series of, view, of views. Each view has a primary. A primary is a dedicated machine whose task is to arrange requests which come from clients concurrently into one specific canonical sequence. So the job of a primary is to assign op numbers to incoming requests so that the order between uh, every two requests is well defined. And then the primary kind of like forms these continuous logs of requests on itself and replicates this logs, uh, this log uh, across backups. What we've been did uh, last time is the fact that although on the primary the lock is continuous, on the backup that's not the case. And uh, there are two reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that uh, we generally do things out of order and the primary uh, might accept a bunch of requests from the clients and start replicating all of the requests across all replicas. And although it first uh, replicates the first request, then the second request, then the third request, because messages uh, can get dropped, it might be the case that like one backup receives the first request, the second backup receives the third request, but not the first one and not the second one. So uh, the second backup now has like a whole of two requests in its log. And that's kind of like uh, the first reason uh, why log might be discontinuous. The second reason uh, why the log might be discontinuous is that time at all doesn't assume that the storage is correct. It uh, accounts for a real possibility that, for example, after we start, when a replica tries to read its log back, there might be some corruption there. Some entries uh, might have been trotted 
they uh, might not be available, which is actually uh, a reasonable uh, failure model, uh, which actually happens in real hardware because, well, modern solid state drives are extremely complicated machines. Like, you know, in the good old days, uh, with like spinning drives, this could just, like, you know, you write data uh, at a particular place in disk and it stays there. With SSDs, there is actually like a small computer right on your SSD, which actually figures out how to map like logical requests to physical uh, requests because well, kind of, like the model, the model of a uh, flash drive, like the physical model doesn't perfectly uh, corresponds to like the logical model uh, that is uh, provided uh, by the operating system to your application. So there is a fair amount of logic for fudging uh, from like uh, logical uh, I/O requests to what physically happens uh, in the flash drive, and that logic can go wrong, especially if this happens due to a power fault. When right? like the power shuts down, the SSD might be cut into uh, individual iterations. And although kind of like uh, usually there is a promise that the result is well defined, empirically that's not always the case. Uh, empirically, it might, might might be the case that like there is uh, observable failure. So if you uh, want to take account, uh, if you uh, kind of like want to build a reliable storage, uh, reliable cluster storage, and you don't want to overpay for making uh, storage of any specific node, like enterprise grade and feel free, then you need to take advantage of cluster redundancy to uh, kind of like repair storage on one replica using data from other replicas. And how this repair works is exactly what we were, what we were looking at last time. So uh, let me refresh uh, this uh, in your memory. Okay, uh, we were looking at uh, replica.zig and there was uh, an on request uh, there was this all request repair model, uh, which uh, deals exactly with this situation. So if a replica understands uh, that it doesn't have uh, a prepare, okay, I think I need to increase font size a little bit. Yeah, I should be better now. Yes, I want to kill this. So. Uh, uh, if a replica uh, finds itself without a particular prepare in its log, it then uh, goes and sends a request prepare request to some other replica. In this request prepare, the crucial bit of information uh, that is included is the checksum of the prepare that the replica is missing. Because well, although prepare, although the replica doesn't have like the prepare itself, it still knows the checksum and it can kind of like ask for very specific thing from other replicas, uh, which uh, it can subsequently verify that the checksum of what it got indeed matches the checksum of uh, what it was requested. And well, uh, the question is like, what if the replica doesn't know the checksum? Well, if the replica doesn't know the checksum of the prepare, then it uh, goes to the primary and asks, the pr and asks the primary, hey, what are the prepares in the current view? Because the primary uh, calls the ultimate authority, authority for a single view, like for what is the sequence of prepares uh, in a particular view. We'll look at that sometime later. Anyway, so. A replica without prepare issues a request prepare. Now some other replica receives this request prepare and goes to find this prepare on disk. And what we're going to look at today is how exactly this reading from disk happens physically. So uh, we're going to, well, we're not going to get into the kernel, but we'll uh, get as close to the kernel as possible. And uh, in this sense, uh, what we'll be covering today would be reminiscent of one of the first episodes where we looked at how networking worked, because we'll again be looking at our I.O. Uh, urine. Uh, but well, that was uh, very complicated code, 
uh, it wasn't uh, very obvious uh, what it was doing the first time around. So it makes uh, a good idea to uh, basically repeat this exercise. So okay, uh, let's uh, trace through this once again. Uh, we get our request prepare. Here is our request prepare message. Uh, then uh, we uh, figure out where uh, which logical slot in our write ahead journal should be occupied by this prepare. Our write ahead journal is a ring buffer. So this slot is essentially the length of the journal uh, modulo the iteration. Well, vice versa, it's iteration modulo the length of the journal. OK, so uh, if we uh, find out that the prepare uh, in this slot on disk is actually the prepare that we are asked to deliver, then we go and read this prepare. And here uh, we like, first of all, special case uh prepares with an empty body so if it's header only we keep headers in memory so we don't even need to go to disk uh, but uh, if it is like you know normal prepare uh which has uh, a body with like transactions or create accounts events then we need uh we need to go and actually read it from this so uh, how exactly that happens? The first thing uh, which we do here is we acquire a read from our reads data structure. So what is reads? Reads is an IOPS. So it's just kind of like a data structure which like tracks something uh, which you can acquire and release. We'll look uh, into it in a minute, but uh, what is important right now is first of all, we parameterize it by the number of reads which are available in total, which is journal IOPS read max, which is just a constant, uh, which would for, uh, let's see in our config, yeah. Uh, which is for uh, a typical cluster is uh, eight input output operations. Uh, okay, so uh, going back to journal. Okay, so uh, this is just uh, a parameter for how many concurrent iterations we want. And then what is an iteration? Well, an iteration is a read. And uh, before uh, we understand uh, what a read is exactly. Uh, let's look at the implementation of this IOPS stack because uh, there is like lots of IOPS uh, everywhere in Tiger uh, Okay, so uh, let's see. It's a data structure uh, which uh, tracks a certain amount of items, and well, uh, here are the items, and it basically tracks whether items are free or occupied. So for each item, uh, we also need a bit set. And that's kind of like a nice uh, structure uh, situation here. So instead of like trying something like item T occupied bool, we essentially create two parallel arrays and then we notice that hey, actually we don't need to store an array of bools because we can actually store just a bit. Set. So uh, if we want to acquire an item here, uh, we just go and in our bit set find the first uh, bit which is set. We mark it as hey, this is now occupied, and we uh, return the corresponding item. Uh, if we want to release an item, uh, well, we take a pointer to an item, then we, using this pointer, we compute the index of an item back, and then we uh, mark corresponding uh, 
uh, correspondent entry as occupied. And I think that's, very, yeah, that's basically it. Like very, very simple data structure. There is also like iterator which uh, iterates, yeah, uh, which iterates all three uh, elements. So again, not rocket science, like it looks, uh, looks pretty uh, like dangerous, like very obsolete. What is AO? But that's, uh, th that's basically it. That's like uh, a data structure which tracks n things and allows us to acquire and release things. Okay. So, uh, we prepare with open and checksum. Uh, so, here we just acquire stuff. And uh, crucially, we uh, uh, go and just like, I, 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 if this were up, it would be like unwrap call. Uh, here we just uh, do question mark, which in Zeek means that hey, we are certain that uh, this is uh, not now. Why, why is it correct to assert here? Well, uh, let's trace the assertions. Uh, so here, uh, we assert that the two kinds of reads, like that, uh, we have like two kinds of reads, like prepare reads and commit reads. And here we assert that actually uh, we kind of like, we have not exceeded maximum for either of those. And here uh, we actually increase one of the counts. And here, uh, if the count was already at the maximum, we actually go and uh, say that hey, we failed to uh, get our read. So even though if even though the prepare might actually be on this, we kind of like say hey, we don't we don't have it simply because we have run out of concurrent uh, input output operations for those reads, uh, which kind of like sounds weird. But it's uh, actually, again, okay, because this is a distributed system, so everything is going to retry anyway, and like eventually, eventually uh, this will work out. Uh, so yeah, kind of like this is, this is again, like uh, a very special thing about target vehicle. You don't, you don't see this kind of codes uh, in most of the systems out there. Because well, typically, well, in a system, if you want to do a read, you just go and, and do a read. Very few systems actually try to physically count how much of anything uh, there could be. And here we just uh, say, say yeah. Uh, just say, yeah, there is just a journal, uh, IOPS. Uh, let me quickly close the slide so that I don't get any notifications here. Uh, yeah, uh, so. Uh, here we just say, okay, that's the, that, that's the amount of reads. Uh, we are going to have to all. So we'll uh, carefully write code to not uh, achieve that. And whenever we try to acquire something, uh, we actually uh, put some assertions uh, to ensure that he actually there is a free one, a free item there. And well, to justify uh, adding uh, uh, this assertion, uh, we actually, like, you know, do the required if checks elsewhere. Okay, so uh, we got uh, we get ourselves a read here. So what's a read? Uh, let's take a look. Oh, actually, no. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's keep the read open in the background and let uh, like see what we are actually uh, doing with this read. And uh, the important thing uh, that we do here is that uh, we take the read and here we go to the storage, where storage is the abstraction for uh, the actual physical disk uh, that we use. And we go to the storage and ask storage to uh, we did it here. So let's open storage. Okay, so uh, what happens here? Uh, what happens here is that uh, we pass the callback for when the read operation uh, will be completed. Uh, we pass 
the buffer, uh, which is where we are going to read our data, and the pass like another read data structure, like storage read. And the crucial thing here is that this uh, read we pass in as a parameter is exactly the same read which would be passed uh, as an argument to the callback. And that's why how in a language without closures, we can, from the callback, uh, restore our original context. So uh, let's get back here. OK, so uh, we have our read. And uh, for this read, read sector function, we go and pass this completion field, which is exactly that storage read that storage needs. And then we pass the callback. So the callback is going to be invoked uh, with this storage read, which is a part of our journal read. So this is our journal uh, read. Uh, so the first thing we do here is that, well, from the storage read, we cast back uh, to the journal read. Because we know kind of like physically, if you draw like an ASCII diagram here, so okay, let's say that this is like going to be our I'm horrible at uh, ASCII diagramming, but bear with me. So this is going to be our storage read. And it's actually going to be a part of a bigger data structure. It's actually going to be a part of journal read. We should probably contain some other stuff than just storage read. So some other stuff here. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what this uh, Zig function, uh, Zig uh, field part pointer does is that it takes a pointer to this inner thing, computes the offset, uh, computes the offset of this read uh, in the parent struct journal read, and adjusts the pointer so that it points not to this field of the struct, but to uh, the struct as a whole. So this essentially will subtract an offset uh, from a pointer and do a required cast. So that way uh, we get a pointer to this entire read struct. Then, uh, if you recall, we assign itself, we assign journal uh, to the journal field of this read. So now that we have cast storage read to journal read, we can do read the journal and regain our own self. So this is kind of like busy work, uh, which uh, like usually uh, you would solve by just like closing over things and like making a closure of the test closures. So uh, uh, we need to uh, do this manually. Uh, then, uh, well, it's, it's actually interesting uh, because it, uh, it turns out we not only need the journal, but you also need the whole replica where the journal is stored. So this is a replica struct. This replica struct holds a journal. So we also uh, get here the replica, validation, encapsulation, a little bit perhaps. Uh, but uh, this, uh, I wonder why do we need this? Well, yeah, because uh, because we want to pass replica to the callback, which actually kind of like, yeah, it, it, it feels like it feels like maybe, well, 
maybe a replica should use the same pattern between replica and journal that we are using here between journal and storage. But it looks like uh, we also want to do some memory management for message. So we actually use this replica not only to pass it to the callback, but to do this message bus and wrap. So probably it is required. So anyway, kind of thing. You know, in the small, there are like always, uh, always ways to improve the code, uh, but you uh, don't always know what is the best pattern to do anything. Um, but kind of like in the graph, you know, thing anyway, that doesn't really matter. Okay. And uh, this part is uh, what we uh, like the callback, uh, what we looked uh, last time. So again, we kind of like uh, basically uh, move the message. Uh, yeah, uh, like the, the, the crucial part here that we'll do with the message is that we'll actually check that the checks are matches uh, what we expect, what was originally requested. And only if the checks are matches, we actually will go and uh, call the callback with non null message. But anyway, that's, that's not what we're interested in today. Uh, today, we are interested in the gaps of this read sector function. Uh, so uh, then let's look at read sectors. Uh, so we kind of like covered a uh, callback and read. Uh, let's look at the other arguments. Buffer. Uh, where are we going to uh, read the data into? Uh, and here we say that buffer is that message. Uh, where are we going to read data? Then zero. So, uh, what is zero? So again, storage is not exactly an abstraction for block device. It is an abstraction for data file. Uh, and data file uh, logically is divided into zones. We've uh, looked at this a couple of times already, but let's take another look. Yeah, so uh, in a data file, a certain amount of a byte is super block. The certain amount of bytes is what headers, then prepare, and then prepares, and prepares is what we are interested in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So every zone has a specific size, right, which is just fixed at compile time, and that's why only uh, the last one, uh, grid, is actually variable in size. So uh, uh, anything else is uh, everything else is completely fixed. Because of this, uh, we can actually uh, for each zone, uh, computes, uh, compute its uh, offset in a physical uh, data file, which is, yeah, kind of just the sum of uh, sizes of all the zones before it. And, uh, well, uh, sorry, like the offset of the zone is the start, and the offset is the start plus uh, logical offsets inside the zone. So at the level of storage, uh, when we do read, we request a read from a specific zone, which in our case would be uh, right ahead log of prepares, the ring buffer of prepares, and we ask a specific offset uh, in this zone. So for us, we know the slot uh, of the prepare we want to read. So we compute offset uh, using the slot, and that is just the size of the prepare. Uh, multiplied by the slot, and that's it. Okay, so um, let's name it. Uh, what do we, uh, what does it actually mean that we want to read something in a particular zone? Well, uh, first of all, uh, that means that, hey, we are not going to read from pattern because we have some extra pattern in our data file to make sure that uh, grid blocks are perfectly aligned, uh, but well, pattern should never ever be read. It should only be zeroed uh, at the start level, so we can just assert that. Then we verify that, yeah, pro probably this one uh, will check that offset in the zone uh, is actually within a zone's size. Uh, so yeah, if uh, the zone has limited size, and uh, only the grid has unlimited size. So if the zone has unlimited size, 
uh, we check that uh, offsetting zone uh, plus length of the buffer is less uh, than a zone size. Again, we like again if, if this you see, uh, we should be very worried about overflows here. This is Zeek. Uh, we compile Zeek in really safe, so we know that uh, every overflow would actually trap, and uh, this kind of computations are not problematic at all. Okay, then we check that uh, the buffer itself is aligned, and that I think is required for. Uh, Direct I/O because we are not. Uh, we are going to use Direct I/O uh, API from within, and I think that actually requires that uh, like you only do I/O in pretty large chunks in uh, the second size of chunks because well, uh, disks are block devices, and the fact that this is block device means exactly that there is like. The granularity of access is not one byte, but well, one block. So you kind of like you need to make sure that everything is a multiple of this block or this sector size. Then yeah, we actually check that okay, uh, this height is not zero, and this is this is actually interesting. So in uh, many kinds of software, like you know, uh, doing nothing. And doing zero of things is actually the same. When you get to low level uh, to something asynchronous, that's actually not exactly the case. Because like if you read zero bytes, that means you still schedule the callback, except that the callback is going to be involved on the next iteration immediately on the next iteration of the event loop. While if you read uh, if you don't read, well, you don't you don't you don't have a callback. So kind of like there is a meaningful distinction between uh, zero bytes and not doing read at all. And the distinction is that, hey, there is no actual asynchrony. So in target you know, we kind of, and yeah, and I think you could, you could take care of that. You could say that, hey, if, you read, if you're reading zero bytes and we're actually going to uh, schedule this fake callback to happen later. But in target you know, in general, we kind of like explicitly track uh, zero, uh, zero length operations. And we try to cover them before, uh, like, but well, basically, kind of like you could deal with like these neural things either at the at the top of the stack and at the bottom of the stack. And although logically uh, those two are correct, if you don't want extra synchrony, uh, you want to uh, track that at the top. And that's exactly what we are doing in uh, Tragedy. So yeah, uh, this assert here is actually. I think uh, a direct consequence uh, of like uh, this uh, this uh, this check here. So kind of like if uh, message sizes so that we don't have to read anything from this. But actually, don't don't read anything from this. We will call back immediately. Uh, so okay, and then uh, yeah. Uh, if uh, this is great, we also check that this is like, aligned to block size and not only to the sector size. So, uh, what a sector of this block? So, a sector is a granularity of our input output uh, with our block device, which is our data file. Kind of like we cannot read or write less than sector size bytes from disk. All our input output operations should be multiple of that. And the block size. Is well, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, blocks when we are going to talk about the grid, but basically, it's kind of like granularity, the larger granularity, uh, which is the logical granularity of all our persistent data structures. But for now, don't worry, okay. grid, grid will come later. Okay, uh, coming back to grid sectors, so we verify them all, then we uh, converted our offset from logical offset in the zone into the physical offset uh, in the storage, and we store that in the storage data structure. 
So again, uh, similarly, this is the stuff that contains the environment for the closure. So here we have uh, where to read data into, so into this buffer, then uh, where uh, to read uh, this data from the offset and storage, and then target packs, which, okay, uh, we should actually see. Uh, I, 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 don't, I, I think I like, roughly understand what is it, but I've never read this too carefully, so let's figure it out. But I think that's actually what we're going to uh, talk about right now, is like how, how do we deal with errors? Okay, so uh, we fill our read. It, our initial target box is the buffer length, so we are going to try to read the entire buffer. And then we start to read. Okay, uh, let's see what happens here. Uh, okay, what is bytes read? So, yeah, apparently, yeah, I think what is happening here is that to service one logical read of this buffer, uh, we might actually have to issue several physical uh, syscalls, several reads to this because, well, there is like so, uh, only uh, so much data uh, which you can shovel uh, between disk and memory using a single iteration. So, kind of like if a journal said, hey, please read this uh, one megabyte from the prepare. Well, may maybe internally we are going to uh, read this one megabyte into chunks of, uh, I don't know, 128 kilobytes or something like that. So, uh, byte thread presumably is uh, how many bytes we have read already. So, if we haven't read anything, uh, then we Okay, yeah, exactly. Uh, if we haven't read anything, then there's a zero. And then we... advance the offset into disk. So the offset starts with like the start offset and any time we read something, we adjust the offset to disk. And we also adjust the offset into the in-memory buffer where we are reading data into. And again, uh, in a language with slices, you actually don't want to track that as an offset. You just want to reassign the entire slice. Okay, what's target? Let's see what's target. It returns target slice into the buffer to read into covered by target max. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, again, we have this extra like target max, uh, which says like uh, how much uh, how much data we want to read at one go. Uh, and uh, that means that while here we cut buffer from the left side, uh, we also uh, need to write it from the right side. So this is uh, what is happening here. And again, we kind of like, try to maintain this sector size. So yeah, I think I think this is kind of like this robustness principle, kind of that when we issue a poll interpreting system, we kind of like uh, make everything aligned by the sector size. It might be the case that we actually read less than the sector size, like for some reason. Uh, and if that happens, we still try to uh, uh, we still try to uh, maintain the overall line. Okay. Uh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I guess that this is uh, this is this is reasonable. So uh, when we call start read, I think bytes read is what we have read uh, the last time around. So. Uh, this is the condition where we say, hey, actually reading process finished, and we can go and uh, invoke a callback on the read. And the callback on the read is exactly that callback uh, which the original user uh, passed to us. 
So at this point, uh, we know that the buffer is actually uh, fully uh, filled by the data from this. Okay, so uh, uh, let's go further. Uh, once more, we uh, check the bounds, and yeah, it's, it seems like our bounds checks are not uh, not that far off here. But, well, but perhaps we can't we can't do anything better. So again, we kind of like, uh, assert that this is a non-empty read. Can we do anything with offset? So offset is yeah, offset is a physical offset in the disk. We yeah, and we can't even like assert that this is inside a green because well maybe maybe we are reading uh, some uh, very initial uh, part of the data file. So again, uh, uh, this could uh, like uh, uh, we we don't have any artificial bound uh, on the size of the data file, so offsets kind of like really really can't be anything. Important thing here is that because this is a disk offset, this is U64 and not U size. Because uh, it might actually be the case that your size of data file is bigger than RAM if you are 30, 32 bits. I don't think we, well, we certainly are not testing Tiger Beetle compiled to 32 bits. I think uh, there are actually are going to be a bunch of compiled time failures if we try to do this. Uh, so we don't like, we, we don't treat this as a priority, but in theory it shouldn't be uh, too hard to adapt Tiger Beetle to work with uh, with 32 bits. Uh, okay, and let's go back into our storage, and then uh, we go and uh, read through I O U E. So. IO ring, uh, I, well, uh, as you see so far, uh, what has been happening is like mostly like, you know, uh, you can can uh, down the road. So, kind of a journal was to read, well, journal asks, asks uh, the storage to read, and then, well, storage asks IO, IO ring to read. So, IO ring is actually uh, the part that is going to do actual reading. So, uh, that's going to be uh, slightly more revolved. And that's why that's kind of like I'll put this on pause right now and see uh, what happens once we complete the three. So uh, again, using this field parent pointer pattern, field parent pointer pattern, uh, we uh, get back our read. And then we kind of like look at this result and that's that's it. so this is this is what you're looking here uh, what you're looking at here is exactly the abstraction boundary the power of abstraction so you see uh the thing is uh here when you read from this we actually get something that might fail with a specific error so uh, our result here is either the number of bytes the disk claims it have actually successfully written on our offset, or it is a read error, which is kind of like a bunch of operating system uh, specific codes, which uh, might get returned if something goes wrong. But in our callback, uh, what? Uh, but in our callback uh, that we. Uh, get from the client well you know actually there isn't any uh there isn't any way to signal failure and let's actually look uh, at the case where failure happens so okay uh we get here we uh start read we do io read and let's say that here we actually like read zero byte and get some result and uh Okay. No, I actually want to unfold uh, everything here. Yeah. Uh, so presumably, this uh, 
I want to understand where this comes from. Yeah, presumably, so, uh, uh -huh, interesting. That's unexpected error. Okay, yeah, so presumably this is like input output is just a uh, catch all error for like anything uh, that can happen because for anything else, yeah, kind of like unexpected, can actually come out, is dear. So, yeah, I, I guess either of these uh, either cannot happen uh, or it is like truly unexpected. Well, and then the best thing we can do is just complete the crush, uh, crush process. So, uh, what happens with errors? Okay, uh, that's interesting. How we? Uh, okay, what, what what happens here? Like, uh, do we? Do we ever, so, okay, in, in both cases, we actually tried to restart the read. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I think I get it. So uh, this is uh, this is exactly that. Uh, uh, this is exactly uh, that uh, target, uh, which is uh, boring. I, th I think I understand that. So okay, uh, there is the, the target mindset. Like how much we are trying to read in one go. And uh, the idea here is that if we see an error, we try to uh, read less than that. And uh, how, how, like, uh, what is less? Like, when it doesn't make sense to read uh, less than sort of the amount. Well, it definitely doesn't make sense to read a single byte at a time. Well, because this is a block device, and uh, the boundary there is actually a size. So, if our target uh, read is actually greater than a secret size, we try to we try to read we try to read less. Uh, if our target is uh, already a sector size. Well, uh, we try to read uh, as little as possible, and we still fail. What do we do here? Well, how do we report this error to the caller? Well, we don't. This is this is this is where magical abstraction happens. Uh, we just say, okay, we failed to read this at all, so we just set it to zero. And then we'll continue our reading uh, after the point that you fail to read. So uh, that means that the concept here is that if the caller uh, issues read sectors, uh, then it actually doesn't know whether the read succeeded or not. Like for example, let's say you issue read sectors, and then you uh, get a buffer as a result, and the buffer is all zeros. Does it mean well, it can mean either of two things? Either the data on disk is really all zeros, and that's what we've uh, read from it, or it means that hey, uh, there is some very data on this, but well, uh, we uh, read some garbage, and we don't make a decision here because well, our uh, failure model uh, allows the disk to uh, fail arbitrary. So the callers already have to deal with a case where the data is garbage. So we don't need to uh, distinguish uh, between the two error cases here. And again, if we go to the caller all the way to the journal, uh, you see that in the callback, we don't actually trust the data that you've just read from this we compare it with a checksum and uh, right here. And well, uh, we know the checksum we want the data to have because when we started reading prepare over here, 
uh, we actually get a checksum as a parameter. So whenever we read anything from disk, we already know the checksum of the data that we expect to get there. So that means we actually can like we actually don't care whether a read succeeded or failed. Like I mean, you know, uh, like here you could like you know you could uh, you don't necessarily need to um, set it to zero. You could just fill it with random bytes. The random bytes won't get to uh, random bytes uh, won't uh, pass the checks and check. So it doesn't matter. Like I mean, you could do differently. You could even like try to guess. Well, maybe this was like this prepare. Like maybe uh, like it could be that you know like it's like a zero prepare and the zero prepare looks like this. And if in that case the checks are matches, well, you guessed right. Uh, or because if you guessed wrong, that actually means that like you should you know uh, write a paper about uh, breaking a cryptographic checksum. Like which is kind of theoretically theoretically possible. Uh, but like not actually computationally uh, feasible. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, kind of like nice, uh, very neat uh, design aspect. Like how how do you do how do you do abstraction? How do you deal with error? Uh, so yeah, uh, let's finally uh, get to this like base case where we try subdivide the read. So okay, uh, we try to read. It failed. Uh, and then we, yeah, uh, well, kind of like some, some logic here. I, I don't want to like understand it, but basically we try to uh, reasonably shorten the amount of uh, Uh, the amount of bytes uh, we actually uh, are trying to read. Okay, so uh, this was a filler case. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we are returning in both cases. So, It's interesting. Yeah, uh, oh, what I'm wondering here, so yeah, the uh, logic here is that we either uh, get a result uh, or we actually diverge uh, and like so kind of like, yeah, well, okay, like this is not entirely expression oriented language, so this is a statement, so we, we yeah, basically I'm wondering like, can this switch uh, return uh, return a value uh, which is used uh, instead of this result? And well, uh, no, it can because it is like uh, it, it would require like an extra block here. So it's actually it's actually syntactically obvious that uh, we are going to diverge and return it. anyway. So uh, if we uh, return an amount of bytes successfully. Uh, then uh, yeah, actually, oh, uh, seriously, because there, there is there is another uh, th there is another filler case here, uh, which is hmm, interesting. I'm wondering if here we should actually. Do an extra mem set because if we try to read data and it returned zero bytes, that means well, this is actually an error. This is like um, uh, end of file. Uh, but on errors, we actually do set. Uh, the input buffer to zero just to make sure that the result is deterministic. And I think, I think method is actually like method is actually missing. Okay, after after this call, I'm actually going to uh, submit the progress. I don't think this is uh, necessary a bug because well, again, we're going to uh, 
do a checksum check after that. And if it passes, then uh, we are fine. And if it doesn't pass, well, okay, it doesn't, doesn't matter what garbage is there. But still, this is, this is interesting. That's, that, that, that's missing that side. OK. Uh, oh, and, and here, uh, <laughs> interesting. So uh, you say that uh, here we try to shorten uh, our target read, and kind of like if we succeed, it, we actually try to increase it. But it, it seems like this logic is incomplete. So we kind of like we read it most like two. Uh, uh, if we if we ever like uh, go to single sector when we kind of increase it to two and not increase it to, to three, I think it should like you know uh, do some sort of like uh, TCP uh, like window. How how is that item called? Well, I don't think you try if like if you're failing, you like reduce the window. But if you're succeeding, you're actually trying to increase it. That's interesting. Uh, but again, that's kind of it. Uh, the code is uh, correct as is. Anyway, uh, after this read, we like start uh, the next attempt at reading. And uh, here, I think what's missing is that if uh, bytes read is not now, we actually assert that bytes read is uh, greater than zero. Uh, anyway, yeah. Okay, this this is this 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 was uh, a deep journey uh, into uh, the guts of our. Uh, storage and we kind of uh, uh, well uh, actually actually let's let, 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 let's go let's go forward for uh, about maybe I don't know twenty minutes half an hour uh, more because I, I promised you to take all the way to the kernel but we actually haven't hit the kernel yet we are like still on our I O Murian abstraction so let's uh, persevere and tear that down. So what is that read? What is like this atomic iteration of reading certain amount of data from uh, our drive? Well, uh, that's going to be in our I.O. In our uh, I.O. Uh, session next month. OK, so uh, let's again uh, see uh, what we have here. We have I.O. Uh, which is an abstraction on top of uh, IO urine. Uh, then uh, here we're actually trying to do uh, strongly typed context, kind of like a, a, diff a different way to do this, like closure thing. Uh, so what's context uh, here? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the context here is just self. Uh, so here we are going to context. What are we going to what are we going to do with context? Yeah. So uh, here we are actually going to type race. So uh, it's important that this context is like context, but this context over here is actually a pointer to any type. Uh, let's uh, check this context. Okay, I don't want this to be case sensitive. Okay, we have yeah, uh, that's th this one. Uh, this one is any type. Okay. So uh, what happens here is uh, type erasure. And then we kind of like how do you call it? like when you when, when you erase back like type I don't know type an erasure uh, where again uh, callback is uh, something which uh, essentially operates with void star pointers 
Uh, and then we like go and cast from that void star to our actual uh, strongly typed context and uh, invoke uh, the callback. And yes, it's actually yeah, it's, 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 this is this is kind of ugly. Uh, I kind of like like the pattern with uh, self parent pointer uh, more because that feels like. Um, it's yeah, it's kind of basically uh, basically easier to do. So kind of like we could have stored uh, uh, the storage uh, here. So maybe 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 we should like uh, harmonize uh, those two patterns for doing these integrations. Anyway, so uh, again. Uh, we are like storing uh, some stuff in completion. Well, uh, what's completion? So completion is something that our uh, caller passed in. And uh, you see here that completion is a field on our uh, read iteration. And here read is what is passed by our caller. This is a journal. And uh, journal stores reads in IOPS. So again, this uh, this completion here actually comes from reads uh, comes from here. So kind of like this is a, this is journal read inside it stores storage read, and inside storage read there is this completion. So again, this is uh, this is here where it all bottoms out. And then we uh, enqueue completion in IO week. So uh, let's uh, look how it works. And uh, this is actually uh, uh, kind of like similar uh, to what we've seen. So uh, again, like IO ring is also a ring buffer. It's also kind of like similar to like our IOPS in that hey, there is like a fixed number of slots. And uh, you kind of like want to get a slot into that ring buffer, but the ring buffer uh, might be full. And uh, what do you do in that case? And this is actually different. So in journal, if we failed to acquire a read, we just drop uh, drop the read on the floor. Uh, we uh, said, hey, we failed to read anything. Like this is uh, this is done. Uh, here uh, we don't drop read on the floor. We actually go and enqueue this iteration uh, into in, in, into the onto the queue of operations which must be retracted. So uh, what's unqueue? Unqueue. So unqueued is a FIFO, and like IOPS is essentially like an array uh, of n things. FIFO is unbounded in size, and it is an intrusive uh, linked list of things. So uh, how is it called? So in M in MQ here, we take our FIFO and we push onto the FIFO. And pushing onto the FIFO means that we take elements and uh, save it here. Our head pointer now points to an element, and the elements uh, Yeah. Uh, okay. So that like the next of our previous head is the new element, and our new head uh, is the element. And uh, what is the next field? One. Uh, well, everything that you store in FIFO, like for example completion, should have a next field which is a pointer to the same kind of thing, which is like yeah, basically include the thing list. And this is uh, this is actually fascinating. So again. Everything in Tiger Middle has a static unit. We never ever like allocate stuff and value. But because this thing is intrusive, this limit isn't specified in a single uh, place in the code base. So like this FIFO actually doesn't know, doesn't know what the limit is, and it doesn't need to care because it doesn't use any extra memory. Because the actual limit for this FIFO 
uh, is going to be no, journal is going to be the sum total of all those like IOPS arrays. So kind of like that FIFO, which is an intrusive linked list, and this IOPS, which is an array, they're kind of like pretty pretty intimately tied together. So okay. Uh, we try to get uh, slot into the submission queue. If we fail, we enqueue ourselves uh, into intrusive linked list of things to do uh, and return. Because, well, uh, if we cannot enqueue something into the submission queue, that means that we have a bunch of operations applied, and that means that once some of those operations finish, We'll actually try to like retry the situation. If we have uh, the slot, we actually go and uh, write into it. So we call this prep map out, and for it, uh, we are going to call I O U ring uh, prep red, which is interesting. How does it? Oh. <laughs> so. That's interesting. So uh, actually, I, I I didn't know this before. Uh, apparently, Zeek doesn't link to lib IOE ring to the C implementation. It actually uh, re-implements everything uh, manually, uh, which is actually cool because well, you can like see how uh, IOE ring uh, works. So uh, that uh, SQE we get. It uh, turns out that it's actually just like a pointer to uh, a slot in this IO ring, which is this extra struct. And uh, what we do here in a prep is just fit in uh, that struct with uh, operations. And again, this is, it's super, it, it should, should, should remind you of something. You know, it's, it's really kind of like uh, uh, low level. I think for me, it's, it, 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 it's all the same kind of stuff. Like we, we, we get read, we like, um, Kill some operations and then we like to do something else. Okay, but this time is uh, this this time this time this is for real. Uh, this time when we are going to uh, delegate something, uh, we're actually going to hit the camera, and that is that that is the reason. So you know, usually, uh, like for example, in uh, storage, when we uh, Field read with fields, uh, then we go and we like call into some low level thing to actually hey, please, please, please do this. So in this uh, IA ring case, we see that actually like the section doesn't happen. So yeah, we, we fill fill the data, but we don't don't uh, don't tell to anything that hey, make this like make this happen. So kind of like what what, what drives this forward? Like this is this is surprising. And this is actually intentional. Uh, the idea here is okay. IO ring is a ring buffer, so you don't want uh, to go to the kernel after every uh, after every iteration. Like if you want to read like ten different files from disk, well, you want to fill ten different slots uh, in your submission queue, and only after. Uh, you want uh, uh, to say the kernel, hey, kernel, please take a look at these 10 operations uh, which I now ask you to do. That's why we're actually not, not driving, uh, intentionally not driving anything here. We just kind of like put the work in there. So to look at the code that actually drives the work here, we need to get back all the way into, into our main. And see how a run for an S works. Well, uh, that was a very short read because uh, run for an S should be here. Run for an S. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, oh, yeah. Uh, let, let, let's see. So, uh, how. Um, Okay, that's that. That's interesting. Uh, ah, that's, 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 well, that's interesting, but also, yeah, I don't want to like explain this uh, in this entirety. That's like too, 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 too many hard stuff. 
Uh, okay, but let's see like what, what where where the place where we kind of like do things. Okay, this is probably probably this. Uh, we yeah. We basically, okay, so kind of like in the loop, we, we run flash submissions and then we run flash submissions. I think this should actually go and do something. Okay, yeah, submit and wait. What is wait and R? I have no idea, but yeah, I think. Yeah, so this this is this is uh, this is this is this is kind of like this is this is the place where the work starts happening. So we filled a bunch of slots in our IO URI, and now we atomically increment uh, the number of submitted slots. And now the kernel can read uh, this uh, tail and realize, hey, there is there is a work I need to pick up. So. I think, uh, yeah, after we've uh, incremented the atomic number, we like additionally like go and incur a syscall. Yes, I will enter is actually a syscall. So kind of like we uh, first make, make this work available for the kernel. And I think the kernel is like in this, at this point, like allowed to opportunistically go and start executing the work. But if kernel actually doesn't know that hey, it should go and look there, we can actually, you know, like kick the kernel. Uh, we like uh, shoot it a system and say, hey, please look there. And that's like the magic of IO ring in that uh, you could prepare a whole bunch of syscalls at the same time without crossing uh, the kernel or uh, the user face kernel boundary. And then at the very end, you submit the whole batch of syscalls in a single uh, in a single syscall in a single uh, privilege escalation to the kernel. And that's again like big idea about terminal batching. Here we see the same batching at the very uh, lowest level. We batch syscalls. Okay, so uh, the, the kernel uh, the kernel is going to do some work, and that is going to communicate back to us. Through completion skew, which is exactly as a submission skew. It's a ring buffer, just an array in memory, with an atomic pointer which says uh, which part of the skew is full. And uh, the kernel is first going to write the data into available uh, completion slots, and then it's going to uh, increment the atomic variable and say, hey, this is this is now ready. And we're going to uh, get notified about that in our flash completions. Uh, so, okay, in our flash completions, we are going to uh, copy Where it is ready? Yeah, here it is. We are going to do this atomic load uh, of like the pointer which is set on the kernel side. And uh, kind of like let's say that that atomic pointer says to us, hey, we kind of like this amount, uh, this come out of uh, completed things. So then we go and for each completed thing, we Look at the user data, and uh, okay. When we do submissions, we should user data. Well, yeah, yeah. This is that's the that's that's the bit of prepare I missed. So in prepare, first we kind of like fill uh, this data using uh, private APIs, and then we fill this like crucial field user data uh, with just a pointer. Uh, to our completion start. And this user data is exactly the thing we get here in flash completions. Uh, 
Uh, so if it's zero, if it is zero, it is timeout. If it is not zero, it is a completion. Uh, and we push this uh, completed completion onto the completed file. Form. And presumably somewhere uh, we should, yeah. And here uh, we uh, eventually, like from this run for an S loop, uh, we will go and uh, walk through intrusive linked list of uh, completions and finally invoke a cover. So let's see how that works. Again, we are interested in the read syscall because we are a reading uh, there. So, okay, uh, competition result is the error code. If it is negative, then uh, that's an error. Uh, we are going to switch it, uh, convert to uh, words like this input output. Unexpected words, that's like, yeah. Uh, convert uh, error codes according to like uh, what you have. And then we uh, are going to uh, call a call. And by that time, well, the data is already there. The data is in the buffer because, again, let's uh, take one look here. So when we uh, prepared our read, we uh, prepare this buffer, uh, which we passed. Uh, uh, it's actually interesting. What's buffer limit? Oh, yeah, I, I think, I think, yeah, we kind of like, we additionally uh, cut this buffer. I, I was thinking about what, what if we actually have, but you know, uh, one of the core assumes that the buffer is read and full. But uh, it actually doesn't assume that uh, because uh, when we call the callback, we pass uh, the number of bytes read. Uh, uh, we, we pass the number of bytes read. So again, if it's negative, then we convert it into any error. If it is positive, uh, then we uh, use this uh, as a result and then the core actually like only looks at uh, those bytes. Okay, uh, I think this uh, completes our uh, journey uh, from like, you know, uh, the very uh, top level of our replica uh, down to uh, the kernel. It might have seemed like a long journey, like, you know, uh, it took us uh, one hour and 10 minutes to cover this. But on the other hand, just realize that we really cover the entire stack. And that means the systems programming is actually easy. Like, you know, like there is, uh, well, there is end of point. Uh, let, 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 let's count up section bears. So we had replica, then a journal, uh, then underneath journal, uh, we had storage. Underneath storage, we have our IOE ring, which is like uh, Linux thing. And underneath uh, IOE ring, we have IOE ring, which is like this standard library, which sits, sits on top of the cat. So again, like, it's just five levels of abstractions, which is quite a lot. But also it's like very, very, very wrinkled. And that's uh, that's a video of it. Like, you know, uh, you can uh, start from nothing and just like, you know, start the beginning uh, and uh, you're going to understand everything because I mean, everything is super simple. Like there is no like complicated code, uh, as I uh, showed you last time. Like the uh, like most complicated code is like this. Like how do we how do we find like the offset of a prepare? Wow, we take the size of a prepare and multiply it by the index, and that's it. That's kind of like the uh, complex level of uh, what we're looking at. Well, actually, well, maybe I'm joking. So well, there was uh, like one complicated thing we've lost over today. And that is and that was exactly those atomic iterations with uh I or Uring to kind of like make sure that we can on user space correctly synchronize. So that that one you cannot you cannot understand in terms of like you know five year old hey uh this box that box that requires some like uh more complicated thinking but the basics here is like super 
uh, super simple. And that's why systems programming is exciting. Because like, you know, some people say, or some people think that, hey, systems programming is actually hard, but that's a lie. Systems programming is exceptionally easy because uh, you could uh, pry any box open and you can just, you know, take all uh, the gears out and then it can put them back. And well, if it doesn't put back exactly right, if there are some gears missing or you uh, find some extra gear as well, like you just git reserve to, or just, you know, just uh, remove the dupe and like git call from the beginning and start over because, well, you can't, can't really break this. Uh, okay, so on this positive note, uh, let's finish. Uh, our uh, deep dive into storage. And next time, uh, we'll be uh, talking more about consensus. Thanks for tuning in and see you in a week.